So our subject today is living your life. <laughs> Are you ready for this? Indistractable. Indistractable. May I tell you a story? <clears throat> now this happened decades ago, and purportedly in Montreal, Canada. Somebody was on trial for their life. I mean, it was cru critical. The prosecutor, the defense, each had been back and forth, and it, and the and the trial was going up and down. It, it was not discernible which way it would end up. But the jury sat there listening, and it came to the closing arguments, and now it was time for the prosecutor to give his final pitch to the jury about the guilt of this person. In the meantime, the defense councilman chose to sit in a chair where only the jury could see him. And while the prosecutor was um, presenting his closing arguments, the defense put his finger in the inkwell, and then he wiped the blue ink on the cheek of his face. And slowly, he did it again and put the ink on the other cheek, and then he smeared some across beside his eye, and then he put it across his forehead and guess what happened? That jury was so distracted watching the defending counselman put ink on his own face, they never heard a word the prosecutor had to say, and the defenseman won his case. <laughs> now, I know that sounds like a really extreme illustration, and it is. But there are consequences when we are distracted. Let's take a look at the definition. Distraction is a charming, or excuse me, a drawing or being drawn away or asunder, pulling away from something that should have your attention. It's a, it's a, uh, a forcible disruption. It's a division or severance from a reality. Now, in scriptures, the opposite to being distracted is this word called steadfast, which means firmly fixed. Um, it can not to be moved or displaced. It means secure in a proper position, fought without change of position, unshakable, immovable in faith, resolution, and friendship. And so these two conditions are just opposed one to another. Distraction versus steadfast. And so our subject is how to live life without being distractible at all. So Let's begin with this point in your notes. Living godly requires being indistractable. So look at the scripture with me. I'm speaking to your prophet. Now, that's really important. And that I, not that I may cast a snare on you, I'm not going to burden you something, but that, but uh, something which is comely, and so that you can, now watch this, attend upon the Lord without distraction. So let's, let's just go through this phrase by phrase. I speak to this as for your own profit. This is for your benefit. And look at this. Not that I want to cast a heavy burden or snare upon you, but I'm telling you this because it's comely to you. <laughs> comely, not a very commonly understood word, but let's look at a definition. It means, means attractive or beautiful, handsome, graceful, elegant, but that which is comely. So it's going to be attractive to you to be indestructible. Now watch this. I'm speaking to your prophet. I don't want to cast a snare on you. I want to be part of the grace of your life. And look at this now, that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Being a genuine Christian requires indistractability. Can't let anything take you off track. Because the stuff of life that you have to deal with is way too important for you or me to be distracted from. And as you'll see in a moment, Life is jammed and crammed with all kinds of distractions. Let's look at a translation. First, I tell you these things to help you. I'm not putting difficulties in your path, 
but I'm setting before you an ideal so that your service of God, now look at this, may be as far as possible free from worldly distractions. Ooh, let's look at one more. Well, let's, let's, let me help you zoom in on this. That your service of God may be as far as possible free of distractions. Whoa, serving God without distraction is a necessity because as you're going to see in a moment, distractions are going to take us away from God. Now comes the Amplified. Let's take a look at what it says. I say for this, for your welfare and profit, not to put a halter of restraint upon you, but to promote that which is seemly, remember, comely, and in good order, and to secure your, now watch this, your undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord. Check the last phrase one more time. To secure your undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord. Living a godly life requires being indistractable. Now, before I get into the details, I want to mention this, that the singular basic distraction of love, which is what we're here for, right? Love is the whole essence. The distraction to living love is a thing in the Bible called iniquity. Look at the scripture. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity is such a distraction that love isn't going to really happen. Well, we've already understood before, if you've spent any time with me at all, to learn that iniquity is the Bible word for um, narcissism. So our selfish pursuits become so obsessive that we don't have time to love because what we're doing is trying to fulfill our own selfishness. So the singular distraction to living love is our selfishness. That's why the Bible also says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which people covet after. And so what happens? They err from the faith and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Why? Because they are distracted by iniquity. Now, you need to understand that distractions always produce consequences. <laughs> uh, this could happen in school, right? Um, grades might be affected if you are distracted. It, uh, um, but you want to be careful when you're walking down the street looking at your phone instead of where you're going. <laughs> in fact, one of the funniest uh, videos I ever saw was a, a, a young lady looking at her cell phone and she's walking along and unbeknownst to her, she walked right into a water fountain and fell over the edge in soaking wet. <laughs> uh, you got to be really careful. You got to be really careful of distractions. And especially when you're driving, don't text, right? You got that straight. I hope so. All kinds of distractions can cause all kinds of problems. Watch out. Distractions produce consequences. And think about the poor person who cannot live without the distraction. Oh, and so multi-images and multimedia and social media, it all comes at us in all different directions. And we end up like the proverbial man who's like walking around with his head in a cloud, doesn't even know what's going on. He is so distracted. <laughs> Distractions produce consequences. Now, Satan, yep, the devil, right? You got him. He got access to mankind by use of distraction. So, Look at what the scripture says. Thou the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said unto the woman, now watch that, here comes a distraction. Hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now watch, watch the distraction. And when the woman saw the distraction, watch it, 
She saw that the tree was good for food. Distraction. And it was pleasant to the eyes. Distraction number two. Three. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. Ha! Huh. Three distractions. And so what did she do? Look at, look at, watch it again. She saw the tree was good. That was distraction for food. It was pleasant to the eyes and it might make her smart. So she took of the fruit and she did eat and she gave also. You know, I hate to skip through these scriptures, so let's just go back and see it one more time. Satan tempted the lady with distractions and she saw that it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. Whoa. It would make her wise, so she thought. She was so distracted that she, you guessed it, took of the, quote, apple. I don't know if it was an apple or not. <laughs> but Satan got access by use of distractions. Now, Satan's strategy of distraction is the same today. Now, he's called the tempter when, remember, this is true of Jesus, and when the tempter came to him, tempter, the tempter. Um, and look at, and, and Paul wrote, I, I wanted to know your faith less by me, some means a tempter, having tempted you, and our labor was in vain, because Satan's strategy is still the same today. So watch now. Um, because Satan's strategy is the same. Look at this scripture. Beware, lest you also, not just Eve, but you also be led away with the error of the wicked. And what does it do? It's going to get you to fall from your own steadfastness. The opposite to distractible is to be steadfast and Satan still wants to tempt you. And why is he doing that? Because he wants you to be led away with the same error. He wants to distract you from steadfastness. And so it's still his strategy today. Now that strategy of Satan it's amazing. There isn't anything particularly intrinsically wrong with technology. But guess what can happen? It can create, the, it is the source of so many distractions. Distractions that the enemy wants to keep you from that which is important from the Word of God. Satan's strategy is the same today. <clears throat> now, here is the real kicker. <clears throat> Satan has an accomplice. He's not just a distractor, okay? He has an accomplice, and that accomplice is actually in every single one of us. And it's called living after the flesh. What's this definition? Accomplice means a partner in an undertaking, an associate, one who helps another commit a crime, a partner in wrongdoing. Satan is not only a tempter, but he has an accomplice. Now, I want you to catch this definition, if you please, because that accomplice is in every single one of us and it's called, it's called living after the flesh. So he tempts you, but there's this appetite that we have for fulfillment of fleshly things that cooperate, support, and back his temptation. So, so here's the definition you really need to grasp. Living after the flesh is a term synonymous with narcissism, self-gratification, and iniquity. 
living after the flesh. So Satan wants to tempt you, and he's making a pitch to a particular part of you and I, which is called after the flesh. Now, that is why your Christian experience must include breaking off this internal intent, desire, ambition to do satisfaction to the flesh because that's Satan's accomplice. Now, let's just take this. This is a really important verse for everyone. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. If you're really in Christ, now watch this, who walk not after the flesh. Yeah, don't, but, oh, there's no condemnation if they don't walk after the flesh, but if instead we walk after the Spirit. Because these two are contrary one to another. Now, another verse is kind of important to grasp and understand this, which I'm sure is your intent. They that are after the flesh do mind. They think about the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit do think and mind the things of the Spirit. So we've got this condition where Satan is making a pitch and he makes an appeal to a part of us that wants to go along with him. It's this thing about after the flesh instead of after the spirit. So let me give you another scripture about this. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh. Now watch it. In the lust of uncleanness, they despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. And they're not, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries because it makes them feel good in their flesh. See? So all of us have this condition that needs to be remedied. And until it's remedied, Satan has this built-in accomplice. For example, <clears throat> this could have been a picture of me, by the way. I'm not casting any stones here. Watch this. Watch him. Watch him. He's got these two options, and he starts to look at the one more than the other because his flesh is not very excited about the apple, but the burger. And so guess what happens next? Well, it doesn't happen just to guys. It happens to girls, too. And so they, they fall prey, too, because the flesh... Let me tell you something. you got to understand that the most dangerous... Um, food is sugar. It's not only the most dangerous, it's the most delightful. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't even be showing these pictures because you might be getting enticed right now as you look at them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the most delicious poison is sugar. And it comes in so many different packages and so many different attractions. And we've got this accomplice inside of us. Now, that's why the scripture says, if you found honey, eat so much as sufficient for thee, lest you be filled with, and vomit it. It can make you sick, right? Well, let's look at a translation. Watch this. When you're given a box of candy, don't gulp it all down. <laughs> eat too much chocolate and you will make yourself sick. <laughs> so Satan sets these traps, like the mouse is after the cheese. The cheese appeals to the mouse. And so Satan is going to put stuff in the trap. Not that it appeals to the mouse, but appeals to us. For example, it could be the almighty dollar and I didn't, I didn't want to parade a whole bunch of sensual pictures before you, but I just put a tube of lipstick in there. <laughs> and so, and so, you know the issue, don't you? Satan has this accomplice living in us, this living after the flesh, 
and she is a subductress. And guess what? She wants to put the hook and take you down because Satan uses those kinds of traps. And they are traps that appeal to us because we like lustful things, whether it be food or otherwise. Satan's accomplice is our living after the flesh. And that is why this next verse is so, so very important. This is part of your ongoing genuine Christian experience. Here it is. And they that are Christ, for sure, for, 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 for certain, for authentic, those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts that go with it. Have you done that? You cannot control the flesh. You have to crucify it. Kill it. It's that scripture, I through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh. I will live. Mortify, kill. Got to kill. And the Spirit of God will help you so that the flesh cannot be um, the hook that Satan uses as an accomplice to get us to yield to temptations which are so damaging in so many ways. Remember, living after the flesh is a term synonymous with narcissism, self-gratification, and iniquity. And it must be crucified. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, it's not I, but Christ that lives in me now. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its lust. Okay, so another thing that can cause distraction is wrong priorities. And I'm going to be as brief as I can about this. Here's the priorities as they are listed in the book of Ephesians. A person should have God first, his spouse second, his children third, his occupation fourth, his ministry to others, and then others. And this is the sequence. Uh, so watch this now, because, because occupation can be a distraction if we put it ahead of our spouse Oh, it's going to damage the marriage. There are some people, there are some that would even put their occupation ahead of God. And they don't honor the Lord's day. Or don't, don't, you know, he, did, he said six days, not six days and nights, shall tell labor, do all thy work. Um, probably the most serious consequence of my life was that I put the ministry way up here, head of spouse, head of children. And at times when I look back and said, I even put it ahead of God, and I love the ministry more than I love God. And consequently, when we change, when we change the proper priorities of life, damage occurs because of it. For if a person puts his ministry ahead of his job, whoa, what happens then? He goes to the job, instead of doing his work, he's talking about the Lord, talking about the Lord, talking about the Lord, and what a terrible witness he is to the others because he should be doing his job, not slothful in business, doing the work. So we have to be careful that, in fact, uh, wrong priorities can um, mess with and cause distraction from what should be going on in the sequence in which they should be prioritized. God, spouse, children, right? V vocation, because he that provides not for his own, especially those of his own household, has denied the faith. And after that comes the ministry and then friendships, etc. Now, <clears throat> another distraction is the overemphasis 
the overemphasization of legitimate activities. In fact, let's take a look at this verse. This is an important verse. Let your moderation be known to all men. Moderation, moderation, moderation. Because when we make something immoderate, when we allow it to be transcendent, it distracts us from what we should be doing. Be careful. Uh, the overemphasis of legitimate activities are distracting. So, could be your vocation, your job. Too much of a distraction. Some people work a day and night. That's not success. 40 hours a week is lots. You can have too much sleep, and that's a distraction. Remember the scripture? A little folding of the hands, a little slumber. Social poverty come to your soul. You want to get your sleep, but not too much sleep. Because an emphasis on any legitimate activity becomes a distraction. Proper food, nutrition, absolutely for sure, but can be a distraction because we've learned to eat for taste and not for nutrition. Yeah. Exercise is good. It profits a little, the scripture says, but it can be a distraction. Friends, family. Why would I put family in there? You know, Jesus said, he said, if you, if you hate not your father and your mother, you cannot, you're not worthy of following me. Now, that word hate, properly understood King James translation, watch, means if you, if you, if you don't love less your father and mother, can't follow me. It doesn't say hate them. It just says they have to be lowered in the priority. It's possible. Now, I'm in favor of family. God's in favor of family for sure. Big thing. But there are people who replace the relationship with God with family. And then vacation is a good idea. <laughs> Some people want a vacation all year round. Amusement, interesting word, by the way, amuse. This word muse means to think. The a ah in front of amuse means to not think. And is it okay to go out of, you know, your empty box sometimes? <laughs> yeah, but some people are absolutely, in fact, we've gotten to a place now where education must be amusement, musing, or people don't learn. Something wrong there. You also want to be careful that you don't overemphasize your past. If you do, it will influence your present and damage your future. You've got to put your past in perspective. Satan will remind you of things you did in the past, but he won't remind you that you were forgiven, cleansed, and renewed. That's why the Apostle Paul was a killer. And this is what he said. How do you become a killer of Christian from a from a killer of Christians to to a writer of 14 books of the New Testament? How do you do that? He had to get a grip on his past. And this is what he said. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. I press the words for the mark, the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now watch. Your past cannot be allowed. Because Jesus comes to make your past go away. Whoa, did you get that? If anybody in Christ, old things pass away and everything becomes new. So watch out, entertainment, etc., and on and on it goes. An overemphasis of anything can cause distraction. So let's conclude now with how, now that we know the dangers of distraction, how do we live indistractable? So here we go um, with the answer to the question. Number one, keep a Bible controlled mind. Oh. 
Because now you've got something that controls you, that's proper, that's right, that's truthful, that's honest, that's pure, that's holy. So, hence the scripture, my son, attend to my words and incline thine ear. Make sure you listen to what I'm saying to you in the scriptures. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in front of you. Keep them in the midst of your heart because they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. So, the first step is to keep a Bible-controlled mind. <clears throat> Second step is to keep your heart from wandering. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Don't let your heart wander away. Uh, well, you can stay focused. <clears throat> Watch what you say, because words have strength and power. Put away from you the froward mouth, perverse lips put far from thee. Why is it important what you say? <clears throat> because faith comes from hearing things. Hearing and hearing, if you hear an advertisement over and over again, most people eventually get enough faith to go and buy the product, give them the money from their pocket and get the product. Because they got faith, because that faith came from hearing the commercial, the commercial, the commercial. Because faith comes from hearing. Now, catch this if you can. The number one listener to what you say is you. That's why you want to be really careful what you say. Put away from the crooked mouth. So only speak the truth that you've learned from God's word. Perverse lips, but far from thee. Stay focused. And distractions want to take away your focus. But look what the scripture says. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyes look straight before thee, ponder the path of thy feet. Let not thy ways, or let all thy ways be established. Don't turn to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from anything that looks like evil. Stay focused. And number five, make sure if you're going to be indistractable, you must lay aside weights and sins. Look at the scripture. Because a weight is a distract. You can't run a race with your rubber boots on. You gotta get the runners on. Huh? You don't carry your backpack. You gotta get rid of the weights if you're going to run the race. If you're gonna be indistractable, look at the scripture. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And now watch this. Don't waste any time. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And then number seven, keep your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. What are the benefits of living life indestructible? I want to point out a few of them because they should motivate you. The first thing is the first benefit is by getting rid of the distractions, we become Christ-like. So you put off the old man with its deeds and you put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So we want to become like him. So we do the essentials, we do the basics, we do what's important and we refuse and distractions, and that makes for a Christ-like life. Secondly, it uh, enables us to live a life that personifies love. Now, the flood of scriptures come to my mind, but this one's important. For this, this is the message which we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So you become like Christ, and so by being indistracted, indistractable, you can love. Remember, that's the real reason we're here. And then you can have an authentic influence if you're indistractable. 
Don't let anybody despise your youth. But be, look at this, be an example of the believers. Watch it now. In the word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Did you get all those? They're all important. One, two, three, four, five, six. I better start counting again. An example of a believer in word, reading for the word, right? Two, in your conversation, the things you speak. Three, the charity and love. Fourth, in spirit. Fifth, in faith. And six, in purity. And that's what makes for an authentic life. And so, indistractable mm, makes you authentic. Authentic. And then number four, by being indistractable, you'll be able to fulfill your embedded natural ability. Now, you probably know them from the King James Scripture as spiritual gift. You have one. It's embedded in you. It doesn't change. God doesn't swap it out for another one. Before you were born, he put this treasure in you. I call it an embedded, by God, an embedded natural ability. So here, let's go with the King James, which calls that a spiritual gift. Let every, as every man hath received a gift. Everybody's got one. Even so, use it as uh, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. How? It's scary for me to even think. I know so many gifted people by God, but they're so distracted. The proclaimer is not proclaiming, and the messenger is not delivering his message. The server or the helper is not helping very much because they're so distracted. The explainer, the teacher, is not doing much explaining because he's distracted. How about the giver? And how about the shower, uh, the, the ruler, the administrator gift? Wow. Every gift should be fully functional. And then, of course, there is the shower of mercy or the caregiver can be so busy doing his own stuff that people get uncared for. If we can live indistractable, one of the benefits is we will have time, energy, and focus on our embedded natural ability. The thing which God put in you that makes you so special and so capable of being a blessing to other people. Now, it's also true that if we're faithful unto death, we will receive the crown of life. And so, how wonderful is that? But watch this one now, because this is so great. The benefits of living an, undistract an, undistractable, an indistractable life is that you will become unseparated from the love of God. Wow. That's why the scripture asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sorrow? No. It is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. We can handle all that stuff. We're not going to be distracted by tribulation or distress or persecution or even famine. No, in all these things, the scripture says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures, and I'll let you look at it. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The benefits of living life indistractable is nothing will take you away from the love of God. 
I hope this has been helpful to you. For my hope is that you, along with me, can cut out of our lives those things that are distracted. And the reason for that is to is to remember, is to remember that we are to serve the Lord without distraction. When you know why you were born, you'll have a new appreciation for your true self. You will know your true purpose in life and you'll know why you matter. Then you'll be equipped to choose a life path full of meaning and joy. Uncover the truth about you. Author David L. Johnston's new book, Why You Were Born, will give you a new appreciation for your true self. Mark Twain said, there are two important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you find out why. And David L. Johnston's new book, Why You Were Born, will launch you on your true path. Take action now and visit nothingbutthetruth.org forward slash born. Live a fulfilling life now without pressures to conform to the ideas and expectations of others. Live the fulfilling life you were created to live and enjoy the freedom, comfort, and confidence that can bring. Become the real you and discover your ENA, your embedded natural abilities. Break free from the prison of your past and experience the joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment you were created for. Act now. Visit nothingbutthetruth.org forward slash born and order your copy of this amazing new book. Visit nothingbutthetruth.org forward slash born. Author David L. Johnston's new book, Why You Were Born, will fill you with new expectation for your best life, the life you were created to live.